In our last study, we looked at the first half of Romans 13, where Paul talked about the Christian's relationship to the civil authorities or to the government. Now we'll turn to the second half of Romans 13, verse 8 to 14, where Paul talks about the love relationship that we Christians should have towards our neighbors. And the neighbor can be anybody who lives next to you or anybody you come in contact with at work or in your daily lives. Jesus made it clear, anyone that needs our help, anyone that I am confronted with in any sphere of living becomes my neighbor. How should Christians deal with their neighbor? What should be the relationship of the Christian to his neighbor? Well, let me read this passage and if you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans 13 and we will look at verses 8 to 14 and then we will analyze it. Here is what Paul says in my New King James Version. Oh, no one, anything, except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, Namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this knowing the time that it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in licentiousness and lewdness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Oh, this is a tremendous passage when it comes to Christian living. It has to do with our relationship to each other and to our fellow man. As I mentioned in a previous study, a Christian is not of this world, but is still living in this world. Because the Bible teaches that we are not of this world, there are many Christians, in the past especially, who went and lived in monasteries, in, secu uh, in secluded places so that they would have no contact with the world. But that is not what God intended the Christian to do. For Jesus made it clear in his prayer to his father in John 17, I pray that you do not take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil of this world. Now, one of the great purposes that God has for every Christian is to reflect to the world, to his neighbors, the love that he has experienced to the gospel. And in chapter 13, verse 8 of Romans, Paul makes it very clear that he who loves another has fulfilled the law. You know, there are two ways to look at the law of God, in the letter or in the spirit or to look at the law as a method of salvation or as a standard of Christian living. The Jews unfortunately looked at the law as the letter or as the method of salvation. To them the law was do's and don'ts. One day one of these great scholars of the law in the Judaism came up to Jesus and you'll find this in Matthew 22 and asked him a question in verse 36. What is the greatest commandment of the book of the law? That is the Torah. And instead of giving him some rules, Jesus said, the greatest commandment found in scripture in the book of the law is loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your being. And the second is like the first, 
that is loving your neighbor as yourself. And on these two loves, Jesus said, rest all the law and the prophets. In other words, to God, the law is not a set of rules. That is what man has turned the law out to be. But to God, the law is a relationship. A relationship of love towards God and towards his fellow man. In a moment, I'm going to give you the distinction between the law as a method of salvation and the law as a standard of Christian living. But what Paul is saying here is that the fulfillment of the law, as God looks at it, is loving your neighbor as yourself. And this is, of course, in the last part of verse 9. What did Paul mean by that? First of all, let us be very clear. Human love is a U-turn agape. What do I mean by that? You see, when God created Adam and Eve, the Bible tells us, the book of Genesis tells us that God created Adam and Eve in his image. And 1 John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. So when God created mankind, he created us in Adam with a nature that was in harmony with God's nature and God's character, which is this agape love, which we have already covered in the past, which is unconditional, which is self-emptying, and which is changeless. And so when, unfortunately, when Eve sinned and brought this forbidden fruit to Adam, Adam realized that Eve had committed the act of sin and that she was to die. But he loved her. He loved her more than himself because his very nature was this unconditional love. And so he was willing to die with her. That is how much Adam loved his wife before the fall. But the moment he ate that forbidden fruit, his nature made a U-turn so that that love which went out unconditionally to Eve and to others now change its direction to himself. And that is what you and I were born with, a nature that is egocentric. And so when God came to, vi to visit Adam and Eve in the evening, that love no longer was towards Eve, but to himself. And so when God asked Adam, why did you sin? He blamed God for giving him a defective wife. What happened to his love towards Eve before his fall? It made a U-turn. And so, human love has all the qualities of God's love except the direction it is towards self. So that we love ourselves unconditionally. We love ourselves everlastingly. We love ourselves more than we love anything else. And that is our human predicament. And what Paul is saying here is genuine law-keeping is loving your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself. That is, you love yourself unconditionally and everlastingly. Now, unfortunately, man cannot do that in and of himself. Let me give an example. In Matthew 19, a young man comes to Jesus and and says this to Jesus. And that you will find this in verse 19. Matthew 19 verse 19. What good thing must I do to have eternal life? Now here was a sinner trying to do good in order to be saved. And Jesus tried to correct him by saying that there is nobody good but God. But he added, if you want to go to heaven by being good, keep the commandments. And the young man said, which ones? And Jesus quoted him the commandment that Paul is quoting here in Romans 13 verse 9. He's quoting, Jesus quoted to this young man the commandments that has to do with our relationship to our neighbors. And Jesus ended up the same way that Paul ends in verse 9 of Romans 13. Jesus said, love your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself. In other words, you love your neighbor spontaneously and unconditionally, just as you naturally love yourself. Well, the young man 
not realizing what Jesus was really saying, said to, Je to Jesus, all these things I kept since I was a youth. What do I lack? And Jesus said, can I test you? Do you really love your neighbor as yourself? Let me prove to you that you don't. Take your wealth, which means so much to you, and give it to the poor, your neighbor, and follow me and I'll give you my wealth. What a bargain! But this young man had not accepted Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah. So, he did not consider this a bargain, but he did consider giving his wealth to the poor a sacrifice that he was not willing to make. And so he's, he left Jesus sorrowfully. And Jesus took this opportunity and showed the disciples that it is impossible for man to love his neighbor in and of himself as he loves himself. But here Paul is advising Christians, love your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself. Well, let me make it clear. The only way you can do that is following the counsel that Paul gives in verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. In other words, only through the indwelling spirit of Christ, which is the representative of Christ, can you love your neighbor in the same way that you spontaneously, unconditionally, everlastingly love yourself? And in 1 Corinthians 13, the whole chapter, Paul spells out the supreme gift of the Holy Spirit to every believer, and that is the agape love of God. Now, having said this, let me go to what I just mentioned earlier. The distinction between law as a method and law as a standard. Let me start by giving you an example. In 1980, I attended a World Council of Churches program, a conference, held only for the pastors there in Nairobi, Kenya. The speaker was the famous, wonderful preacher, John Stott. The attendants were the pastors of Kenya, 1,500 pastors from approximately 83 denominations. John Stott gave us a series of studies from the book of Thessalonians. And this is what he said in about the third study. He said, we evangelicals know how to preach the good news, but we have failed to preach the good life. And the reason for that is because we have done away with the law. And then he added, the law was never done away with as a standard of Christian living. You see, the New Testament makes a distinction between the law as a method of salvation and the law as a standard of salvation. In the book of Romans, in chapter 9 and in chapter you know, 3, verse 28, especially, Paul makes it clear that God never gave the law as a method of salvation. This was the mistake of the Jews. But when he comes to chapter 13, he is now lifting up the law as a standard of Christian living. What is the difference? Well, I would like to show you four major differences between the law as a method of salvation, which... Paul uses the expression works of the law. When Paul uses that expression works of the law, he means the man using the law as a method of salvation. And I would like to show four distinctions between that and the law as a standard of Christian living, which is what Paul upholds in chapter 13 of Romans. The first distinction is this. When I keep the law as a method, then I'm using the law as a letter only. That is, the law comes, comes to me in terms of do's and don'ts. You know, the Jews had all kinds of rules. They took the law of God and made it into rules, do's and don'ts. For example, in Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus talks about these rules. They had 248 rules and 365 prohibitions in terms of the law. But 
when I keep the law as a standard motivated by faith that worketh, love becomes the fulfillment of the law. You see, the gospel creates in me a heart appreciation for what God did to me in Jesus Christ. He redeemed me. He reconciled me. And so, I have now responded by a faith that is motivated or works by love. And the Holy Spirit brings that important ingredient called agape into my heart. And the love of God constrains me. And the love of God reproduces in me the character, the life of Christ, which is in harmony with the law. Roman, sorry, Galatians 5 verse 22 onwards, Paul talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering and so on. And then he ends up by saying, against such there is no law. In other words, these fruits of the Spirit is the fulfillment of the law. The law doesn't condemn the fruits of the Spirit. They are in perfect harmony with its requirements. So, law as a method is keeping the law in the letter, do's and don'ts. Law in the, as a standard is keeping the law from the heart, motivated by love. The second distinction is this. When the law is kept as a method of salvation, it produces only external righteousness. I would like you to look at a statement that Paul, that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 15. And if you are using your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 15. I am going to read verse 8 and 9. Listen to these two, statements, two, two, two verses in chapter 15 of Matthew. Verse 8 and 9. Jesus is quoting from the book of Isaiah. And this is what the prophet Isaiah said. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You see, the Jews took the law, which is based on the love of God, and turned them into rules, regulations, prohibitions, and by keeping these rules, they, were, they thought that they were keeping the law. But their law obedience, these keeping of the rules was only an external righteousness. Their heart was far away from God. But when we keep the law as a standard, the law first of all becomes a delight. It does not become a set of rules. And number two, it becomes a delight in terms of an inward obedience. In other words, a person who keeps the law as a standard, controlled by the Holy Spirit, motivated by love, keeps the law from the heart. You know, I one day at, uh, took a week of prayer at a, at a Christian college which had very strict rules. And I preached to these students a whole week of the wonderful message of salvation by grace. One of the faculty came up to me and said, how do we as an institution practice righteousness by faith? And I said to him, first of all, you must make a distinction between the rules that your college has set up and Christianity. Every college has rules, including government colleges. Let the students realize that these rules are the rules of the college. Do not link them with Christianity because if you do, the students will look upon these rules as Christianity and Christianity is not a set of rules. Christianity is a relationship with God and my fellow men. Christianity is justification by faith. The fruits is holiness of living. Then give them Christ so that they are converted men and women. Give them Christ in such a way that the love of Christ constrains them so that they can say with Paul, for me to live is Christ. I ate during that week with the students. 
and I discovered there were two groups of students in that college. About 90% of those students came to this college with its strict rules. They came to this college because they wanted to be there. The other 10% came there because they were sent there by their parents to be reformed. Those that came there on their own free will did not need these rules. They were already converted Christians. They were already living a life that was in harmony with the, with the rules of the college, and so they did not need those rules. But the 10 of them, 10% rather of them, who were sent there by their parents, to them, this college was hell. As one girl said to me, please don't tell my mother that this is a wonderful college. And I said to her, why not? And you know what she said? I do not want three more years of hell. To her, being in this college was like being in a prison. Folks, righteousness by faith begins from the heart. God works from inside outward. Legalism, that is the law as a method, is only concerned about external performance. Now let me go to number three distinction. This external righteousness that the law keepers produce when they keep the law as a method of salvation may look good to men, but to God it is an abomination. You know, in Isaiah 64 verse 6, we are told that all our righteousness is in God's eyes filthy rags. And then in Luke 16 verse 15, listen to this. I'm going to read from Luke 15 and verse 15. Luke 16, rather, and verse 15. See what the Gospel writer Luke says in verse 15 of his 16th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And he said to them, that is, to the Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves before men. This is Christ talking to the Pharisees. But God knows your heart, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You see, God looks at your heart. Men looks at the external performance. That's the distinction. When a Christian, saved by grace, controlled by the Spirit, motivated by love in his behavior, obeys the law. It is not a set of rules. It is not simply external righteousness. It is God, Christ, living in me by faith. In fact, in Hebrews 8, verse 10 to 13, and also in Ezekiel 36, verse 25 to 28, in fact, Hebrews 8, 10 to 13 is a quotation from Ezekiel 36. The writer of Hebrews tells us what the new covenant is all about. You see, in legalism, the law is written on tables of stone. In the gospel, the law is written in your hearts. God promises to write the law in your hearts. He promises to put the ingredient that is the basis of all law keeping. He is agape love. So that we may walk, we may behave, we may have relationship with our neighbors as God has with us. A love relationship. And finally, the righteousness of the law when it is used as a method of salvation is a righteousness that glorifies man. Remember the Pharisee who prayed in the temple recorded in Luke 18 verse 11 and 12. He said, God, I thank you I'm not a sinner like this publican at the back. I fast twice a week. I do this and I do that. I pay tithe. The publican at the back said, hardly looking up at God, God, forgive me a sinner. And Jesus said, it is the publican who went home justified. You see, man is only concerned about, his, about himself, how good he looks to others. But a Christian who is keeping the law as a standard considers himself a sinner and does not look down on others, but is living a life of love towards others. And so what Paul is saying here in Romans 13 verse 8 
onwards is that a true Christian looks at the law not as a method of salvation. He has already been justified in Christ. He looks at the law as a standard of Christian living and allows the Holy Spirit to produce in him the obedience that is reflecting the love of God, the character of Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 11 of chapter 13 of Romans, Paul makes this statement, and do this, knowing the time that is now, it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. What is Paul saying here? He's saying here that even though I am saved in Christ, my final salvation, the consummation, the reality of my salvation is future. You know, it is important as I close this passage that we realize what the New Testament teaches about salvation. There are many Christians who think that they are, who claim that they are saved and they stop there. No, salvation in the New Testament is presented in all three tenses, in the past, in the present, and in the future tense. In other words, a person who has been justified by faith, a person who has received the gospel by faith and has accepted Christ as his Messiah and Savior, can confess, I am saved. In other words, a Christian is already saved in terms of the guilt and the punishment of sin. But a Christian must not stop there. We must go on and say, I am being saved in the present continuous tense. In what sense I am being saved? From the power and slavery of sin. That is what God saves me daily from through the Holy Spirit as I put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, the Christian can say, must also say, I will be saved. From what? From the nature and the presence of sin. In other words, a Christian is saved because he is justified by faith. He is being saved because sanctification is a daily process that goes on throughout his lifespan. And he can say, I will be saved in terms of glorification because when Christ comes, this corruption will put on incorruption and this mortal will put on immortality. In other words, in Jesus Christ, we have salvation, full and complete. And it is not enough for us to simply say, I am saved. The world needs to see that salvation in our daily lives. And that salvation in our daily life is keeping the law as a standard. Loving our neighbor in the same way that we love ourselves. And when this happens, the world will realize that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it is my prayer that we will not be Christian just in word, but in action. And we will look forward to the day when Christ will come and take us home. This is my prayer for each listener as we conclude chapter 13 of Romans. Amen.